I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a kind of a general overview of our next, our, our main uh, keynote speaker. Um, and this is Dr. Mike Spigaleri. Those of you who have been here before um, have seen and listened to Mike. Um, he told me he actually prepared this one. Last, last year, you kind of did it on a wing and a prayer, and it was an amazing, <laughs> just amazing. My, Mike, uh, Dr. Spigaleri, Mike Spigaleri, anyway. <laughs> Dr. Spigaleri um, has an ability that if we were to, to say, what do you think about whatever, uh, the, we would be ending the conference still wanting more. I mean, he'd go through both days, including the night, and, and just is a, is a wealth of information. Um, formally, he uh, graduated from the Uni University of Michigan with his MD degree and a PhD in medicinal chemistry. I don't even know what that means. Um, completed his residency in internal medicine as well as pediatrics. Did a fellowship in adolescent medicine and clinical pharmacology. He completed an MBA as if he didn't have enough degrees. And, um, and said that this would really kind of change his life. And um, I'll let him share what he wants to share, but he is uh, certainly an exemplar of what we're all talking about in terms of adopting these principles into his personal life. Um, he's been in the academic world for some time, uh, and he's transitioning now as a consultant and entrepreneur. Um, he's working on all these projects, addiction treatment, application development, diagnosis, provision of business services, and regulatory approval. He started several businesses and tends to enjoy solving complex problems. Um, <laughs> truly, I, I value Mike's friendship a whole lot. Uh, we go out to lunch, and I just am in awe and, and, and wonder of his experiences, of his insights, and it is my privilege to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Spigaleri. <laughs> well, as always, I, I never quite think I can, I can match um, the pressure that Glenn puts on. <laughs> so, so I'm vibrating. <laughs> Um, and, and this talk is a talk that is an attempt to begin a conversation that every time we do a conference, whether it's this one or a similar one, I get asked the same question. Why aren't we more integrated? What's, what's getting in the way? Because if you're here, you're a believer. <laughs> this is the choir. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, we are still struggling. Right? We've, as Glenn said, we got rid of alternative medicine. So now we're complementary or integrative health or whatever. I'm, I'm going to throw them all on and just say we're, we should be integrated. Because integration is getting rid of those extra lines. Because all of those lines, whether it's the 6 or 12 or 10,329 dimensions of hell, every time we draw a line, we find a place to hide behind. And we hide not because we want to hide, but we hide because it is comfortable. It's safe. I'm comfortable with my beliefs. Right? Here I am at the University of Utah wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> How did that happen? By choice. I like blue. <laughs> so this is, this is the, the formal description. This is more of how I think of the world. I'm just Mike. I've always been Mike. That's what I answer to. Or Steve or Bill. I mean, I pretty much name it. I'm, I'm willing to answer to it. As with all talks, you have to put in your disclaimers. 
we don't want this to be commercially biased. So as always, <laughs> I've yet to figure out how to profit from these presentations. So I have nothing to declare. <laughs> there, there is nothing that I found in this. If you have suggestions about how to make money off this, I'm open. <laughs> I have no magic answers, which is my standard disclaimer. So if you've heard me talk, this is on every one of my disclaimers. Um, and just so I didn't have to put the same person on, I decided to give a talk with a bunch of quotes from the same author. We'll get to that at the end. If anybody can guess before we get there, we'll, let you, we'll give you a prize. OK. So the objectives of, of this little interactive session are to understand some barriers and obstacles to a fully interconnected integrative system. Now, I should pause there and say, is there anybody who would disagree with that goal? That we should have an integrative system. Everything should help everything else. We are going to discuss, action word, discuss, meaning there will be talking, just to start to warn you. You will have to talk. We will do some networking. Again, you will have to talk and be friendly. <laughs> and we will hopefully interactively demonstrate a functional integrative strategy. So let me, let me do my audience polling game here. How many of you help people? <laughs> How many of you try to make some money off helping people? OK, good, good, good. How many of you try to make all of your living off helping people? OK. So, so for those whose hands went down in that thing, Why are you doing other things? Are you doing other things to pay for what you love? Because that's usually the answer, right? I have to have this other job so that I can afford to help people. <laughs> you're starting to laugh because you're starting to understand the ridiculousness of that world. Right? So I'm going to stay, and again, a big disclaimer, I'm a physician, so I'm going to stay away from health. I'm going to go to wellness and stay in wellness. Because I think wellness is a better term. Health is, in my mind, an outdated term. Health comes from the time when anything that wasn't healthy for you killed you. So it was good to be healthy. Now we live in a world where we live with chronic things that make us not perfectly healthy, but doesn't diminish our idea that we want to be well. <laughs> and so to me, health is limiting. If we're going to get there, this is a team journey. Not only the people in this room, but everybody yet to be born on the planet has to be part of this team. You will be asked questions. I have Sara helping me, who actually has a microphone, who's going to like come to you if you don't volunteer appropriately quickly enough. Um, because your wisdom is needed, and it will help. So here's, the, here's the, the pitch to the choir, right? Thoughts on integration. Integration is the natural state. Disintegration is not and never will be natural. We are connected. Glenn's intro was perfect. We are connected to everything in the universe. Why then do we live in pockets? Why do we fight to stay 
in our bubbles. We live there because we've learned to live there. We have a false belief that it's safer. Another bias. I am a researcher by nature. Glenn brought up childlike resilience. Children are natural researchers. Right? What's the favorite word of a two-year-old? Why? 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 You have to go to bed. Why? Because I'll kill you if you don't sleep. <laughs> I need a break. That's why. We don't say that because that would be damaging. <laughs> so research is the best friend of integration. I have seen integration begin to work. I've seen it with my patients, my clients, my friends, my family. Touch. And I will say that full integration works better than can be imagined for many of the reasons that Glenn was hitting on. But integration is impossible. <laughs> I've heard it after every one of these conferences and I hear it on a daily basis. We can't do that. We can't do that, we can't do that here. <laughs> we can't do that there. I'm starting to sound like Dr. Seuss here. Would you, could you on a bus? <laughs> Don't ever be a pessimist. A pessimist is correct, is correct oftener than an optimist. But an optimist has more fun. And neither can stop the march of events. Things will happen. It's better to be positive. People will like you more. So, do you believe Do you trust in this idea of integrated wellness? And now the hard questions. Do you trust everything? Can you live in a space where your mind is so open that you are willing to trust that all of the boxes on Glenn's slides are true and real, and that some of them are not hokey, like string theory. Brian Greene's a great guy, but, <laughs> but do you believe all of it? Because I'm going to argue that you need to. <laughs> because we don't know enough to dismiss any. Maybe then the next harder question, do you trust everyone? A lot of these conferences, as a physician, I'm the enemy. <laughs> I'm the one that's the problem. Right? I keep you from earning your living. Because I don't send people to you, which is untrue, but but the perception is the reason why we need a complementary medical system is because the mainstream medical system is stealing all of the patients. <laughs> so to be here says I must be trusted, or I'm a good scapegoat. But, but that's, the, that's the issue here, right? Because... Everybody knows there are certain parts of this integrated world that are just crazy to believe in. How can whatever fill in the blank with anything that you don't believe in? How can whatever fills in that blank work? That's for the crazy people. Smart people believe like me. And they trust what I believe in. And because they're smart people, they know and they can come to the same rational conclusion that the other stuff is crap. 
I'm going to say that this is the dangerous path that keeps us stuck in our silos. Is that this lack of trust. I don't know because my crystal ball is in the shop. How to best help anyone. I know how to do my best job. And tomorrow I hope my best job will be a little bit better than today. But I don't know if my best is good enough to help anyone. And I certainly know it's not good enough to help everyone. The person who goes to that fill-in-the-blank quackery <laughs> that receives benefit from it has received benefit. <laughs> it is not quackery. It worked. <laughs> so if it's possible, why is it so hard to do? If anybody can actually do that, <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> this trust piece is the piece that's missing. From the client side, it's trust in the practitioners, in the healers, in the whatever. How can somebody from Price, Utah trust in something from India when they don't trust in something from Salt Lake? <laughs> we haven't done a good job. We as healers, helpers, practitioners, don't fully trust our clients. They might be gaming us. <laughs> they might be scamming us. They might be looking for attention. Would it be bad to give them that attention? <laughs> we certainly don't trust the payers, particularly the third-party payers. Because somehow they just say no. It's like that old credit card commercial. Can I use my miles for that? No. <laughs> Can I? No. <laughs> right, we don't trust them. At the end of the day, we don't trust ourselves. <laughs> That's the problem. We have to begin to trust ourselves. We have to begin to be OK with this idea that the best I can do might not be good enough for everybody. <laughs> because as soon as I do that, then I have to look beyond that wall that I've trapped myself in. <laughs> and then I can climb out. So what is trust? They're actually stacking up blocks that say trust, in case you wonder. Um, this is a conversation that when I see teenage and young adult patients, I have this conversation two or three times every session. And it always starts out with either the parent or the teenager saying, they don't trust me. And I have to sort of stop and break the conversation right there and say, wait a minute, let's talk about trust. Trust is earned. <laughs> it is, it is, it is earned. It is not given. You don't get trust as an inalienable right. <laughs> you get it by what you do. The energy you put forth builds trust. Trust requires constant nurturing. It cannot be left alone. <clears throat> Distrust is easier. <laughs> it's safer. Because trust requires taking a risk. Distrust is easy. No. 
you can't go out tonight. Right? Because what bad could happen at home? Believe me, as somebody who takes care of young adults, I can give you a whole list. <laughs> and trust does best with verification. Crazy idea about trust, right? This, this, was, the, this was the Cold War saying. Right? Trust but verify. You don't have missiles there? Good, let me see. <laughs> Wait a minute, we're still doing that. <laughs> okay. So, this is the participation part. So, for the next several minutes, I want everyone to think about how we could possibly integrate with each other. And what it would take. So we're going to define a system. We, we are selecting six volunteers. Oh, worse than the fire hose effect. You know the fire hose effect? That's where everybody sits in the back because they think they won't get wet. The whole room is the splash zone, so... So, and we're going to do this from the perspective of a provider or a healer or a practitioner because I think it's safer. So, do we have six? Six volunteers? Yeah. So, so, so what Sarah is going to do is she's coming to you and you're going to play the part, whether you are in life or not, you're going to play the part of a healer. And your livelihood is dependent upon your clients. And what Sarah's doing is Sarah is coming to give you clients in the form of beads. <laughs> so we will have six providers, and they each provide a color so we don't have to fight with each other about what I picked. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we will have six types of clients. And, you, <laughs> and, and you'll notice, Sara is doing this great thing called randomization. She has a heart-shaped bowl with equal number of six different colored beads, and she's going to give you a couple of scoops. So, so as she's passing this out, let's think about how artificial of a system I just created. We have six healers. We have a bowl of people who are looking for healers, which means they are already somewhat accepting of what you're offering. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. This is a simulation. This is a model. Sarah has it. <laughs> so clients, customers, patients, family members, I don't care, all the same, they love what you, some of them, love what you do. Not only do they come back and they're return paying customers, which is good, but they tell other people how fantastic you are. Like your mom, for most of you. Some like what you do. They don't really like you as much as your mom did. They keep coming back to see you, but they don't necessarily go out and find business for you. They will bring people in if somebody asks them very directly, but they're not in the business of just going out and making friends for you. Some, this is where the honesty comes in. I'm, I'm always terribly honest, which scares people. Some don't like what you do. And if you've ever tried to help more than one person, I'm sure you've experienced this. <laughs> and they don't come back. Which from a billing standpoint, it means you get to bill them once, <laughs> and they're gone. 
And last but not least, some hate what you do, and they have blogs. And they tell other people on Yelp how crappy you are. <laughs> That's why we pick beads. They're not quite so personal. So in marketing science, this is, this is endorser, distractor. So we look, you've all been given those. How likely are you to recommend this service, flight, airline, car rental. If you say eight or if you say nine or ten, the company loves you because they go, those are people who are going to tell other people how great we are. If you say seven or eight, they like you because you're paying for the car or the airline ticket, but they know you're not going to go out and promote them, so this is a net promoter score. And anything under seven, six and below, you're not their customer anyway. So we have our six volunteers. Who is the red provider? Who got the red bead to say that they were the red provider? OK. So for the red provider, now he is the best red provider that there's ever been. He knows it. He's been to Red Provider College. <laughs> he's got Red Provider credentials and licensing. And he's got an office right down on Red Provider Street. <laughs> How many red beads did you get in your cup? So for a red provider, the red beads are the, are the clients that are the most synonymous with you. They resonate with you without trying. They love you. They're going to tell other people good things about you. Right? So red. I know, we can highlight the red. Purple and orange are kind of like red. So purple and orange are good clients. They're going to come back. Yellow and blue, they're not quite so much like red. This is the problem with Provo and Salt Lake. Right? <laughs> red and blue aren't quite so alike. They're in the same state, so they don't hate each other as much as they could. But <laughs> go with me. It's an analogy. Um, so how many green ones do you have? Nine. Random draw. He has more customers that are going to say bad things about him than positive. The rest of you who have different color, your different color providers, the way you score it is whatever color you are. So if you're blue, blue resonate the most with you. Green and purple are close. They're going to come back. These guys aren't going to come back, and this one hates you. So look at your nice random collections of beads. And look at how many customers you're not going to see again. And look at how many could, might, would hurt you by saying that you're a crackpot. <laughs> Are you starting to get the, the, the message behind this bead game? So, so between, for, for, for Dr. Red, <laughs> do you have more purple, red, and orange than the others? Now, for those of you who do this full time, 
how accurate is my game? I'm seeing some nodding heads, right? About half, randomly about half. Now, in, in business theory, A red for a red provider will get you three new customers in a year. A green will lose you ten. So, clients who are a good fit, <laughs> this is genius stuff I know, Remain clients. Some recommend you to others. More recommendations mean more clients mean you don't need the other job <laughs> to support what you do. Clients who are a poor fit don't come back and some actively hurt your business. Now, I want to take a step and say that what I'm saying is true not only for individual providers, but for the systems that each of us have been trained or feel comfortable with. There are some people who have such a negative experience from the medical field that they will never go back in spite of having cancer, in spite of having pneumonia, in spite of having things that the medical field can probably do something about, they have been turned off so badly that they will never go back. You've met these people. And they will try to convert you from ever going back to the medical field. The bad experiences harm us all. They harm the providers, they harm the system, and most importantly, they harm the people looking for help. So how do we fix this? Right? Because what I'm describing is the natural order. Right? This just is. And maybe I should put another piece in the natural order. Every one of these folks who have beads sitting in front of them have two problems. One is people don't come in wearing a shirt saying they believe in you or they hate you. So it's hard to tell the difference. And second of all, these are the clients they have. What if they lose one? What if they give up one? Then they have client minus one in their practice. And that doesn't sound good because then they're not going to have a business. They're going to have to have even more of that secondary job <laughs> to help themselves out. So how can we improve? I can show you evidence on this. I'm not going to waste your time showing it to you. The number one answer to this question is this. We don't. We just keep doing it the same old way. <laughs> because that's being stuck in another silo. That's the silo that says, this is the only way I know how to do this, and so this is the only way I'm going to do it. So. Everybody who has a cup full of beads, if you don't change, what happens is in a week, a month, a year, you get some more beads. And they come out of the same bowl. <laughs> and you get the same results. <laughs> some like you, some don't. Ah, what we have to do is fix the beads. The problem is the beads. <laughs> if the blue provider could just have more blue beads, life would be better. 
right? Fix the problem. The problem isn't me. <laughs> it's them. How do we fix that problem? We advertise. I was sort of joking about the Red Provider being on Red Provider Street with the degree from Red Provider University. <laughs> That's where all the initials come after our names. <laughs> right? We advertise because we're trying to fix the problem. Maybe a little bit less comfortable, but probably more realistically, we fix ourselves. <laughs> And in fixing ourselves, we probably change the system. <laughs> and we probably get closer to that, that integrative wellness plan. So if you don't like the bowl you're in, <laughs> if you swim around fast enough to get enough momentum, you can jump into the next one. <laughs> I think this is a fake picture. So let's, let's think about the choices. We'll, we'll leave the let's leave it as it is one alone, because you can figure out what happens there. So if we could only find those clients that liked us, if acupuncture could only find people who would like acupuncture, wouldn't that be a neat thing? Well. How do we find them? Anybody have thoughts? Pretty quiet for an interactive group. You laugh at my dumb jokes, but. We recommend things because not everything works for everybody. Some people are different. I'm paraphrasing, but we're trying to record it. So, <laughs> right? We recommend. So, what else can we do? How, how do we get people to try what we're offering? Have an open mind. Oh, have an open mind. See, you guys are going for the good ones. I was expecting coupons. <laughs> huh? Groupons. Groupons. Be better than coupons. E coupons. Um, educate. educate. Who do we educate? The clients. Potential clients. The clients? The system. Other providers. The system. Other providers? I'm going to argue that we need the to public. educate. The public. The public. Everybody. <coughs> Todo el mundo. Everybody. <laughs> or better yet, let's just avoid the ones we don't like. <laughs> right? How do we find them? We tell them what we don't do. We tell them what we don't do, but they've already found us if we're telling them. So we have to actively discourage it. It's hard to have an anti-coupon, right? <laughs> <laughs> like what we used to do in college, we'd sign up our roommates for like magazine subscriptions to things that they couldn't possibly be interested just to laugh at. <laughs> there is an anti-coupon that you mentioned, Yelp. <laughs> Yelp. <laughs> Recommendations, right? But we can't recommend the clients. We Yelp gets us. So, and I think my bigger question is, how does this not make the situation worse? As soon as we start putting negative energy into this system, it gets worse. It's the, you know, it's the 802, 805, 815 part of Glenn's story. The negative energy starts to create a self-destructive force. And I would argue there's enough self-destructive energy already. We don't need to add any more. So we can change ourselves. How do we get better? Right. Education, interaction, conferences. We learn more. I'm going to argue that most of what we learn is we learn how to do what we do better. We need to begin to start understanding our limitations, back to the comment about some things don't work for everybody. 
I would say nothing works for everybody. But we have to start understanding where the stuff that we're offering doesn't work for somebody. Because then we can start this process of, of recommending. What would that do in the scenario with the beads? Your comment. We tell people what we can't do. Very, very important. If we had a way, go ahead. It might help get someone connected to a service that would resonate more with them so we'd all be more connected. We're fixing the system now, though, right? I think that's the answer. So if, if the green provider, or the red provider could find the green people, and now this is where I'm going to leap into heresy. If they could find, if the red provider could find the green client before they charge them any money, before they cost them any time, before they cost them a trip to red provider street, What happens? What's the outcome of that interaction? Huh? It's win-win. They can't say bad things about you because they never experience the things they don't like. And instead, they say good things about you because they say, they didn't even take my money. They sent me to a green provider. The system spirals upward. <laughs> we can tell others how much better we are. <laughs> Again, this is the negative outcome. <laughs> I am the best blue provider there's ever been. The problem with this is this is terribly detrimental to the system. Because if I'm the best blue provider and I make sure everybody knows it, I'm likely not the first blue provider or the last blue provider that the customer, the client, the family member will ever see. I'm now poisoning the well because all blue providers are arrogant. This is what the medical profession has done for far too long. <laughs> this is where the criticism towards the medical field is valid. <laughs> we already did this one. How can we change the system? Okay. We began this crazy idea of understanding ourselves and our customers and trying to make pairings that will work. <laughs> so back to the demo, just to be concrete. What do we do with the clients that will not benefit from what we offer? We talked about this a little bit. Do we kill them? Because if we kill them before they can say bad things about us, and we can hide the bodies well enough, we do well. Again, negative energy. I think we need to help them, and we need to help them by recommending. We talked about that one. So my solution to why we aren't as fully integrated as I would like to see us is trust. <laughs> I asked the question, how many of you help? I'm going to go out on a limb and say that nobody raised their hand just to be contrary. Everybody believes that they have something positive to offer. You need to make the outreach efforts. You need to know the people who offer the green services and the blue services and the yellow services and God forbid the chartreuse services. And I'm being agnostic with name of practice because I don't want to endorse or 
inadvertently not indoors. Everything works. If you began thinking outside the box, you can solve the color problem. It's simple. So I'm going to use the medical word, but recommend is equally good. Refer clients to other providers. <laughs> refer often and refer as quickly as you possibly get a hint that they could be helped more with somebody else exclusively or in combination with you. And I would argue that combination is even better. <laughs> but for the, back to my red provider friend, he's not going to sync with the green person anyways. Refer that person as quickly as possible. Express gratitude. When somebody refers somebody to you, you have two obligations. <laughs> Let them know that the person came to see you. Close the loop. <laughs> Thank you for referring the person to me. They came. Does two things. It strengthens your connection with the other person. And it says that you care enough about helping people that the next time there's somebody to refer, they're going to get sent to you even faster. Second of all, be positive. Always positive. If the biggest idiot in the world refers somebody to you, refrain from telling the client that the person that referred them to you was an idiot. <laughs> Let that sink in for a second and think what that would sound like. <laughs> oh, that person's an idiot. Do you often take the advice of an idiot? <laughs> That's politics. <laughs> Those are laws. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you take the advice of an idiot, you're an idiot yourself. So as soon as you call that person an idiot, that's the person that referred the person to you. You're questioning them, their judgment in sending somebody to you, which is undermining your own credibility from the moment the thought enters your head. <laughs> Lose that thought as rapidly as possible. So, Mike, I'm, I'm struggling here a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, you know, you know we're, we're, we're trained mm -hmm. that we want to refer people to people who have license mm -hmm. certifications and whatever, and to be careful with those that are labeled kind of old school, you know, the quack thing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but we're, you're talking about this accepting everyone kind of mm -hmm. thing. Are there lines that you want to draw? Yes, absolutely. Remember my trust with verification thing? Trust is earned. There are things, as Glenn said, that are licensed, regulated, provided, in the state of Utah, if you want to get a piercing, piercing is regular. You have to have a license from the same people who give me my medical license. Does that mean that you want somebody who does piercings to do brain surgery? Probably not. Maybe, but probably not. Trust, but verify. <laughs> they say they can do it. Ask who they've done it on. See if they're still living. Um, <laughs> What I'm suggesting is that in this system, 
I'm arguing for feedback. And, and let's, let's answer Glenn's question because it, it comes perfectly into where I was headed. So what happens if you refer the clients that aren't going to come back anyways? Have you lost anything? No. You might have helped something. Right? Even if you refer them to somebody who is a quack. <laughs> At least they're not darkening your door. What happens if you refer patients that are going to come back anyways? <laughs> this is the magic one, right? This is the verification. You do something. Last year I gave a talk about helping an eating disorder patient and how I referred and, and do refer to a variety of providers, nutritionists, yoga instructors, um, you name it. Those are patients that are going to come back and see me anyways. But they're going to come back to me and they're going to tell me how the interaction went. And they're going to give me direct feedback from somebody that I know and trust and who knows and trusts me as to whether they got a service that was what they expected. If it's positive, great fantastic, the eating disorder patient comes back and tells me that the yoga instructor was out of the world, what do I do? I pick up the phone and I call the yoga instructor and thank them. If they tell me the experience wasn't what they wanted, what do I do? I ask the patient what they would have expected and I call the yoga professor and ask if they do that and if not, who might? <laughs> and I'm giving feedback to help the yoga person grow their business. <laughs> and so back to the credentialing things. Can you refer people to, to somebody who is completely unlicensed, unheard of, they've just come up, you know, Carl Jung just came up with this Jungian psychology stuff in his basement, and you're the person who's going to refer the first person to Carl Jung. Yeah, you can. Trust, but verify. So in general, the first referral I make to somebody, if I'm a red provider, is a red patient. Because they know me and love me already. If they go and have a terrible experience, they're going to come back and they are going to read me the riot act. <laughs> but they're going to tell me. And then I'm going to put on my research hat and we're going to leave the slides behind. I'm starting to do research. Right? I'm starting to look at the characteristics of the person that I sent and the characteristics of the healer that they went to. And I'm getting better at matching and I'm better at figuring out what the color of my client is and what the color of the person I'm referring them is. Because in the end, my goal is simple, to help. <laughs> the caveat that I'll take off Glenn's question in one step farther is, what happens when somebody comes to you with something that you've never heard of? How many of you have had this happen? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Do not instantaneously dismiss. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Mood lighting. Um, <laughs> that was eerie how that came in right at that point. <laughs> Good thing I wore blue. <laughs> um, listen, ask questions. Why do they want to go to this person, this type of healing, whatever? Educate yourself. If there's somebody who's been seeing you for a while, have them go. Run the experiment. Have them come back and tell you about it. You may be missing the greatest thing <laughs> since sliced bread. Not that sliced bread is all that great, but 
you know, it's one of those things. So we have a duty to take care of, to help people. And that's the essence of what Glenn was saying. Don't randomly send people into harm's way. Discuss things. Before I send somebody, again, I'm not picking on yoga, I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying it's one of the services that I use often. If I send somebody to see a yoga provider, the first question I ask is, do you know what yoga is? The second thing I say is, I don't know enough about yoga to tell you everything. But here's how I think yoga might help you. Does that sound like something you might want to do? <laughs> the same thing for crystal therapy. The same, I mean, there is nothing that helps <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> so I'm going to stop and ask, let you ask me some questions and beat me up because for an interactive session, you haven't talked much. And I even had somebody walking around on the microphone. So what can I answer for you? What can I tell you? What can I atone for? <laughs> uh, you said earlier that nothing that, um, that helps, that everything helps or something like that. And I just wanted to clarify something because it, it rang a bell in my head about um, <laughs> conversion therapy. Um, there are people who would argue, and I am one, that that is destructive and harmful, yes. and I could say other words. No, um, and, and so I just am concerned to about clarifying that. Yes, so, so maybe I should be very clear on my definition of help, because I would agree completely with you on conversion therapy and some other things. If your goal is to get to Los Angeles, <laughs> and somebody helps you get to Seattle, they didn't help you. And I would put conversion therapy in my, my estimation in that category. They're taking you somewhere that is not where you wanted to go or helpful for you. I think the reason that things that are destructive, and let's, let's pick on the medical field because it's a little bit safer sometimes. We in the medical profession have had the cure for depression at least two major times in history. We had it with the onset of cocaine. And you're laughing, but that's what Freud made his living off of. He prescribed cocaine to people to fix their depression. Why? Because he liked cocaine himself. But that's a whole other story. Um, the second time we cured depression was with lobotomies. Very, very simple. We took an ice pick and stuck it up through people's eye socket and cut the front part of their brain off. It worked great. It worked so well, we did it on the president's sister. This is the story of, of John Kennedy's sister. Those are destructive therapies. They don't really help. The only way to limit their impact is to break down all of the walls so that the communication is so clear that we can begin to see when things aren't working and we can help. I don't believe in this one person is the one helper for one other person and that's it. It has to be an exclusive controlling relationship. Those are dangerous relationships all the time. <laughs> People are helped by the community. They aren't helped by a single individual. conscientious provider, regardless of whether it's a yoga instructor or a primary care physician, to guide, to proactively guide a client away from a therapy if that therapy is actually known to be harmful. And to, as a follow-up to that, and pardon my ignorance, but is it not generally recognized in the medical community at large that conversion therapy is inappropriate and harmful? Uh, in, in backwards order, recognized at large, yes. 
Recognized in total? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> in terms of that, the first part of the question, is it, is it useful, instructive to guide? Yes. But please guide positively. We know in the medical profession, we find out about somewhere between 5 and 10% of complementary medicine that's being used by our patients. The reason we find out about that at such an alarmingly low rate is because our attitude is so poor that people don't feel like we would look at them as competent human beings if they told us that they might be using something as crazy as acupuncture. We have to be open and positive. Now, for somebody who's had osteoarthritis who decides that they're going to start running uh, barefoot up the mountain, do I, do I recommend that? No. I try to get them into something that's not going to beat up their joints worse. So yeah, I help guide them. But if they're dead set on becoming a runner, then I try to do the best I can to facilitate their running. And I suggest treadmills and, and light impact and other things like that. And I, again, I'm a researcher, so I tell them, let's try that for a little bit and see how it helps. <laughs> And so it's way better to do that in a positive way, in my opinion, than to shut people down and say, oh my god, that's crazy. Because that's what we've done. And, and I would argue we've all done it. We've all inadvertently let the inner voice in our own head, which goes, that crap could never work. <laughs> it's come out in true words or it's come out in body language. Please, please start checking the body language at the door and looking because if our goal is to help, then that's the only filter that you get to judge whether you were successful. Did it help? And, and to your question, I agree completely. There are problems we do not want to hurt. And lobotomies were not helpful. The medical profession has learned a lot of times. You shouldn't just cut things out randomly. Right? We used to take tonsils out. We kind of learned that was probably a bad idea. We used to cut people's front part of their brains off. That was a bad idea. Um, it doesn't stop us from coming up with the latest, greatest thing that we're going to fix that way. But in the absence of interconnected intercommunication, everybody believes that the problems get so great that they have to be solved. This is, the, this is the old saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It is a very dangerous thing to pound on everything with a hammer. And whatever hammer you happen to have, it will work on the kind of nails that, that are similar to what you do. Please use your hammer sparingly. <laughs> and don't get upset at the screwdrivers and the, <laughs> the everything else's that are out there. They have a role, and sometimes their role will be more useful than yours. So. <laughs> <laughs>